a few genes. I am new to town, and I will admit, I am uh, working to embrace the Western wear. So you may get some rhinestone cowgirl one of these days, but for now, I'm, I'm taking my time. Thank you so much for joining us for the State of the Region. As you know, we were previously scheduled to have this event in December, uh, so thank you for your flexibility in joining us today. To begin today's program, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the El Paso County Sheriff's Office Honor Guard, and please remain standing after the presentation of the colors for our national anthem that will be performed by the Colorado Springs Gospel Music Workshop of America. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars. You may take your seats and begin your lunch, but first, let's definitely give a big round of applause and thank you. Everyone, please be seated. So thank you so much for joining us today. We host this event every year in collaboration with El Paso County to keep you informed of the good things going on that help foster a very strong business climate. I am John Reeder Claymeyer. I am your new president and CEO of the Colorado Springs Chamber and Economic Development Corporation. Thank you very much. There are many elected officials working together in our region to help our business community thrive. And I'd like to thank those with us here today. If you would, please stand when your name is called, but audience, would you hold off on that applause until I finish the list? From El Paso County, commissioners, Chairman Stan Vanderwerf, Carrie Geithner, Lojinos Gonzalez Jr., Holly Williams, Sheriff Bill Elder, K. 
County Clerk and Recorder Chuck Browerman. Coroner, Dr. Leon Kelly. Let's give them a round of applause. And from the city of Colorado Springs, Mayor John Southers. Let me read all of the city councilors. President Tom Strand, Councilmember Randy Helms, Councilwoman Nancy Hygem, Councilmember David Donaldson, and last but certainly not least, Councilman Wayne Williams. From the city of Fountain, I have Mayor Sharon Thompson and council members Deetra Duncan and Gordon Rich. From the town of Monument, Mayor Don Wilson. And last but not least, we have two staff members. From the office of Senator John Hickenlooper, we have Antonio Huerta. Thank you, Antonio. And from the office of Congressman Doug Lamborn, we have Cassandra Sebastian. Cassandra. Now also here today, we have members from the Chamber and EDC's Board of Directors. These individuals help guide our strategy and have made just tremendous investment of time and effort in our organization and in our business community. If you're a current board member of the Chamber and EDC, would you please stand and be recognized? Now, today's event would not be possible without our generous support of our sponsors. And I want to thank you to our gold sponsor and event partner in El Paso County. And you will hear from them in just a moment. But let me also read a list of our silver sponsors. Please hold your applause until the end. Amazon, AT&T, The Beauty Bar, Davidson Technologies, and the Pikes Peak Small Business Development Center. Thank you, Bron our silver sponsors. And to our bronze sponsors, the Colorado Springs Airport, El Pomar Foundation, the Gold Hill Mesa, Pinnaca Financial Group, and Stratus IQ Fiber Internet. Thank you, bronze sponsors. And last, but certainly not least, our media sponsor, thanks to the Gazette. So your support helped make today's programming possible, and we want to thank you for helping us share the, I won't say the good things, I'll say the great things that are going on in El Paso County. It's truly been a pleasure to be a part of this event because it's a testimony to the celebration of the good work and close partnerships that the Chamber and EDC have with El Paso County. To highlight today's theme, focusing on doing the next right thing. It has and will continue to guide our region towards a very bright future. To share a bit more, please join me in welcoming El Paso County Commissioner Lojinos Gonzalez, Jr. to the stage. Lojinos? Thank you, Jana. Good morning, everyone. We have all experienced many changes in our lives, our workplaces, and in our communities this last year. In times like these, we are reminded that hardship is unavoidable, yet it is not without purpose. And our purpose at El Paso County centers around doing the next right thing for our citizens and going above and beyond for those most in need. Doing the next right thing in 2021 meant not just delivering top-notch services, but also going the extra mile to help those in the direst circumstances, like our military veterans, at-risk children, and more than ever, 
those suffering the loss of loved ones. That's why it's important that we share the success stories of our partnerships with Mount Carmel, the District Attorney's Office, and Hope and Home that lift this region to new heights. So let's take a few minutes to hear from Sam Aiken, Paul and Betty Crashock, and Harmony Graham, and how their darkest moments have been made bright when El Paso County and our partners work together to do the next right thing. So I wanted to be in the military since I was nine. Um, when I was watching the news for 9-11, I knew I wanted to be in the military, just didn't know which branch. So I joined when I was 17. I joined the Army, I was a mechanic, and I was in for five and a half years. And um, I was stationed at Fort Hood the whole time. I got out of the military in November of 2015. Um, I didn't really know what to do, because I've only ever known the military. So I called Mount Carmel, and I spoke with Madison, and I told her I wanted to start my own company, and she really supported it, so I did, and I started Partisan Painting. My little sister just moved here as well and she wants to get her real estate license, so I'm referring her to Pikes Peak Work Workforce Center since she's not military. And had, I, had you guys not been partnered with Mount Carmel, I never would have heard about it. And you know, there's yet another life that can be changed. And I always refer people there to let them know, like, you know, if you, if you want to better your life and you need that education or you, know, you have a career path you really want to go to, you know, I, I send people there. I also think it's extremely remarkable that El Paso County has so many resources for veterans, and even people that aren't veterans, but it's, it's great to see that our community cares about our military. With the painting side of things, you know, they just kept supporting me, and I needed that support to be successful, and then just gone full circle, now I have other, I have seven employees, and Mount Carmel sent me those veterans who needed employment too. And if they didn't, we didn't have Mount Carmel, I, they wouldn't have gone there and I wouldn't have found them. So um, it's really important. So even though they just helped one person, uh, me at the time, it came around and I, I then helped seven more people and hopefully more as we get more work. But um, if those programs didn't exist, I mean, that, that's seven households that would have been struggling. I don't know where I would have got the money or, or the courage to use my own money or, or save the money for that with my family. They didn't make me feel um, belittled for asking for help. You know, they, they were there to support me to do better. She was stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado. She was in the military. She was in uh, the 73rd Wheeled Maintenance. She had been out there for almost two years. A gentleman from the military came to the door, uh, uh, told me that uh, Darlene had been killed. It was a homicide. We hopped a plane and went to Colorado. They never gave up, even after it went cold. Betty was on the computer and doing everything and anything she could find. She would call the detectives. You know, we put a lot of effort into it as well, and I, I can't thank those guys out there enough.
So when they made the arrest, Detective Joseph Samoski actually is the one that called us. And he asked me uh, if Betty was around or close. And I said, yes. Well, he said, can you get her up by you? I want you both to hear what I have to tell you. He said, uh, we've waited 32 years to tell you this. He says, we have made an arrest in Darlene's case. Time stood still for us oh, for a little bit. They went above and beyond. 32 years on the case and they never gave up. We went out for the trial and uh, or for the arraignment. He was officially charged. Uh, the detectives was there in the courtroom with this. Paul Ziggin and Coet, they were sitting right there with us. I mean, it was like a family had yes. surrounded us. The court date was set, and then COVID hit, and everything started getting postponed and moved up and moved up. Ben and Joe made one heck of a team. <laughs> they did. They did that. They were at it from the start until the end, and they—it was just typical of the whole judicial system they just didn't give up they had a hold of it and they were not turning loose nobody expected uh, we would even have a verdict before the following monday we got a phone call all about 10 minutes after three from coyote <laughs> and she says we have a verdict oh my gosh within three hours the juries came in and all, and and he asked the, the jury if they had reached a verdict. The, the four persons stood up and said, yes, Your Honor, we have. Betty had a hold of my hand and my arm, and it was like a vice grip. And I, I do. I think we stopped breathing, and the, the um, four person read, um, on the charge of first degree murder with deliberation, we the jury find him guilty. And on the second charge, we find him guilty. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then the judge sends him to life without parole and Hallelujah. That closed the page in that chapter. Good day, everyone. My name is Harmony Graham, and I'm going to share with you my story of how El Paso County and their partnership with Hope and Home has changed my life forever. You know, some may pity a foster child, and in some circumstances, that may be acceptable. However, in my case, not so much. I believe that entering the foster system has provided family, culture, success, and other opportunities that my biological family couldn't afford me. Indeed, it was not the most ideal situation to be in, but I decided to take advantage of it. I entered the system at my own will and was blessed to be placed in the care of a Hope and Home family. I'm sure you're curious as to what my circumstances were before I entered the system, and it was quite simply put, penalty and neglect. All right, maybe a little more detail is necessary. I became a mother at the age of 15 in a home where I was exposed to drug and alcohol abuse, neglect, physical and emotional abuse. Prior to my pregnancy, my father would get overly intoxicated, physically assault my mother and me. 
I don't remember my father being sober most of my childhood. There was cocaine and marijuana use as well, but I didn't directly observe that. My mother was a meth addict and would bring volatile people into our home while I was pregnant. She would be up for days on end, selling our things and neglecting to take care of our essentials. I remember being pregnant and so skinny that I went to WIC and the representative told me I could be turned in because I was so skinny. Well, I'm sure she didn't know that I didn't have food at home. Our electric bill would go unpaid, sewer lines were backed up, I wasn't enrolled in school, I had nothing. Mind you, I didn't finish eighth grade at that point. The day I left was the day my mom had a domestic dispute with her significant other. She came running out of the room with a broken face, crying hysterically and throwing things. I had called my best friend's mom at the time and said, I really need help, can you come grab me? She had let me stay in her home for a good two months and then my parents would call and harass her and tell her, you know, well, tell her crazy things and she couldn't do it anymore. So then I had called DHS and reported myself. I said, I needed help. I tried to go get TANF, food stamps, anything to help support my child and myself at the time. And they asked, where are your parents? Well, great question. I wasn't sure. So later that day, after enrolling myself into school under the McKinney-Vento Act, I was picked up by my caseworker and she took me to my new home. Today I work at Hope and Home as a research assistant, and I guess once you're a Hope and Homie, you're always a Hope and Homie. Uh, let's expand on that. Gina, who is my chief of staff, gave me her number 10 years ago, 10 years ago and said, call anytime. Well, I took her up on that offer and I'm not sure how she feels about it, but here we are. Um, one day, I specifically called and said, hey, I'm separating from active duty and leaving Montana. Do you guys need any help down there? She said, yes, absolutely. They found a spot for me, and here I am. I'm here with Hope and Home. I just recently finished my bachelor's degree in health science, and I'm pursuing the PA program. PA program um, at CU Denver next year. My son Triton is 10 years old and is doing exceptionally well. My high school sweetheart finally popped the question back in April. It's been a long eight years, let me tell you. And <laughs> things have turned out great for my family and I. And thanks to Hope and Home and their partnership with El Paso County, I wouldn't be here today or I'd be a different person. The undying support of this foster care agency, my family, and friends has afforded me huge opportunities. So to that I think, so what if I'm a statistic? I'm blessed because I face adversity and it's not the other way around. That's all I have, thank you. I wasn't ready for that. Um, thank you so much for all the personal stories. It means a lot hearing from Sam Aitken, uh, from Paul and Betty Crashock, and then especially Harmony getting your in-person testimony. Um, I've been doing this a long time and it's a little nerve wracking. I'm very impressed with you coming up here today. Uh, if things don't work out with Hope and Home, uh, I'm, I'm needing a few employees at the Chamber of Commerce, so I am always looking for talent. So. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you to the El Paso County, um, the Sheriff's Department, and, and to Jobs and Family Services. This is the kind of work that we just don't think about every day that is going on behind the scenes, those unsung heroes. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> it's now my pleasure to welcome El Paso County Commissioner Chair Stan Vanderwerk to the state to the stage this year to give our annual address. You know, Commissioner Vanderwerf serves District 3, encompassing Central and Western El Paso County. 
which just happens to be my district commissioner, so I have you on speed dial, yes. Commissioner Vanderwerf has 35 years of experience in C-level positions in industry and in public agencies. In these scientific, engineering, and contracting positions, he engaged in both research and development, manufacturing and sustainment of a wide variety of products from space systems to airplanes to electronics. He is the founder of several small businesses, including Unmanned Aircraft Systems, UAS Colorado, Advanced Capital LLC, which is an aerospace defense consulting company, and Simtech USA, a computer-aided design firm and 3D printing business. He previously served 28 years in the U.S. Air Force, including assignments at NORAD NORTHCOM, as well as Peterson and Shriver Air Space Force bases. Commissioner Vanderwerf is a distinguished graduate from the Industrial College, College of the Air Forces, achieving a master's degree in public policy and budgeting. Will you please join me in giving a warm welcome to the chair of the board of El Paso County Commissioners, Stan Vanderwerf. All right, thank you, Jonna, for the kind introduction, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Obviously, this event was supposed to be a month ago, but we're an organization that prizes doing the next right thing, even when it's inconvenient. We didn't think it was wise, nor I don't think you would appreciate me giving a speech two days after testing positive for COVID-19. So we rescheduled. I thank you for your patience and flexibility, and I especially thank the one guy that still showed up on December 9. <laughs> At this point of the speech, we were going to give Dirk a proper send-off with gifts and everything, but instead, uh, he got a plaque and a county-branded bow tie in an impromptu ceremony after an ugly sweater Christmas party, and those are words I never thought I would say in a speech. But we can still give him an ovation. Dirk, if you're watching, thank you for our, your service to our community. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to report the state of the region is stronger than ever. I say that proudly, knowing our region has survived unprecedented challenges and uncertainty due to COVID and other issues. We're strong because we have persevered together. Our economy remains robust. Our citizens have worked hard to stay safe. Most of our companies have survived, and, uh, and many are thriving. And through it all, El Paso County has and continues to remain open. In many ways, our county contributes to the reputation of our region. In 2021 alone, we received multiple National Association of Counties awards recognizing economic development, public works, human services, and our housing authority. Just two months ago, our Veterans Office received public recognition, and virtually every county department has won a prestigious award over the last few years, showcasing the skills and impact of the work they do. Our region is different from others throughout the country. We work together despite the challenges that we have faced. When COVID subsides and when heated elections are over, we can and must remain friends and continue working together for the betterment of the region because it's the next right thing. And that brings me to the title of this speech, Doing the Next Right Thing. For me, this speaks not only to what we've done over the past years, but also to our strength and vision for the future. El Paso County now has the largest population in Colorado at 737,000 residents. We have more people than three U.S. states and the District of Columbia. We have more veterans in our county than 53 counties in Colorado have total population. We have a strong and vibrant economy. Everything our county does is amplified by its size and scope. We are no longer a small community. We have economic and political power, 
and we can and should use our strength for the betterment of our citizens and our economy. And while we are a successful county, we could not get the job done without the great contributions of our partners. We are grateful to every organization, both public and private, who work with us to improve the lives of our citizens. For example, El Paso County recently negotiated an annexation agreement with our partner, the City of Colorado Springs, to streamline county to city annexations. This is a win for our citizens and future development, and it's the kind of cooperation that other counties are starting to emulate. In addition to have, uh, having good partners, El Paso County has been a good partner. My colleagues were thrilled to make a sizable financial uh, contribution to start Southwest Airlines service here. We played a key role in negotiating state and county agreements for distribution of the state's opioid settlement funds, and we are providing county services, including veteran services, through many partner offices like Mount Carmel. And we do so much more. When it comes to county leadership, we have done the next right thing. We are pleased to welcome many new executive staff, including Brett Waters, county administrator, Stacy Quiddick, executive director of human services, Kevin Maston, our public works director, Todd Martz, our community services director, more affectionately known as our parks director, and Pete Carey, director of our newly created Justice Services Department. Now, it was hard to say goodbye to our former county administrator, Amy Folsom. Amy served our region for years as a skilled prosecutor and county administrator. But above all else, she was kind and full of integrity. And my thanks to the rest of our former senior staff for their great service to the community as well. My commissioner colleagues and I were thrilled when Brett Waters accepted our offer to lead the county. Brett knows our community. He's motivated by service and values, and he knows how to get things done. Brett, thank you for joining our team. And if you do not know Brett, please reach out to him soon. As for our Board of County Commissioners, I am proud that we have such a dedicated group of elected officials who are committed to doing the next right thing. I deeply appreciate my colleagues who often have made difficult decisions. For example, the balance between COVID safety and personal rights. All of them serve on many boards for, uh, in our community and my personal thanks to all, including our Vice Chair, Cami Bremer, for her passion for health, human services, and public-private partnerships. To Lejinos Gonzalez, for your support of veterans, getting people back to work, and your work in water management. To Holly Williams, for your work on roads, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and regional collaboration. And to Carrie Geithner, for your work on housing development, countywide broadband, and our fight against opioids. We also welcome our new district attorney, Michael Allen. Our DA's office is the busiest in the state, and under Michael's leadership, they have launched several valuable new measures to make our community safer, including a prescription, prescription drug diversion program, Kids Against Crime, and an anti-animal abuse program. But nothing illustrates the value of this office more than the work they did to get justice for specialist Darlene Krashek and her parents, Paul and Betty Lou. As you saw from the video, justice required the dedicated effort of many people. We thank all those who woke up every day for 32 years doing the next right thing to get justice for this family. Let's give them a round of applause. My thanks also to Sheriff Elder. We are thrilled to announce that our jail has recently been accredited by the American Correctional Association and the National Commission on Correctional Health Care. These accreditations recognize the dedication and professionalism with which the jail is managed and how we protect our community and serve our incarcerated residents. 
Sheriff Elder is also working on getting full accreditation from the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, and that would be a, crippled, a triple crown achievement. But I am also proud of the great men and women who serve in county law enforcement. You know, I served 28 years in the U.S. Air Force, commanding and leading overseas. I considered myself fortunate that I never lost anyone under my watch. I had to become a county commissioner to lose two deputy sheriffs while on duty. You know, theirs is a dangerous job, often fraught with danger, and we owe our law enforcement professionals who have sacrificed at many levels a debt of gratitude. And let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Essential to public safety is our continued funding and support for our public health team. Ladies and gentlemen, 699. This is how many days public health has responded to the pandemic. And they've done it with the right touch. Funding vaccination clinics, augmenting manpower, helping thousands of citizens and companies and offering monoclonal antibody treatment services for free. Our local public health team has correctly relied on education and collaboration instead of mandates to help us make good choices. While, we deserve, uh, while many deserve credit for the successes in the fight against COVID, none deserve more than Susan Whelan and her staff. This virus has been a challenge no public health department would ever ask to face. But Susan led our community with unwavering professionalism and tact. Thank you, El Paso County Public Health, for choosing each day to do the next right thing. Now we also have an outstanding clerk and recorder's office led by Chuck Browerman. <laughs> and it looks like he's got his own fan club over here as well. He and his staff manage dozens of citizen services, but it's the work he's done recently in elections which truly sets him apart. After the presidential election, Chuck and his team took the unprecedented step to voluntarily initiate a full ballot recount on a separate system. To go a step further, Chuck and Michael Allen created a full-time staff position whose sole responsibility will be to investigate and root out voter fraud. El Paso County residents can set this, uh, El Paso County continues to set the standard that other counties should follow. And El Paso County residents can rest assured that our elections here are secure and accurate. Now, with our abundant natural beauty and regional strength, we know that growth is inevitable. In El Paso County, in both 2020 and 2021, we approved record numbers of new resident applications, both single and multifamily. We're projected to reach over a million people by 2050, and development will be the key regional issue we'll face in the future. Our challenge is this. How do we grow thoughtfully while maintaining the essential characteristics of our region. With extensive community input, data-driven projections, and expert collaboration, our planning department team, led by Craig Dossey, has delivered a well-designed, modern, county-wide master plan that will better manage land use and infrastructure while honoring the characteristics that make our region great. And we continue to work with our partners to ensure we protect the needs of our citizens while striving to improve our processes to make homes more affordable. This includes senior tax exemption portability and reducing initial development land reuse review time, among many other initiatives. Another facet of responsible growth is road infrastructure. 
Since 2017, we added over $13 million to maintain more than 4,400 lane miles of roads and more than 260 bridges. We replaced over 40 outdated, outdated maintenance vehicles and improved our relationship with CDOT. We completed or have under construction every project listed on our 2017 ballot measure, which the voters supported. We kept our promise. Today, we have many CDOT and county road projects in our region, and this year, we put in another $15.5 million for 2022 in one-time funding towards transportation. We still have a lot of unfunded road needs that we tried to fix with ballot measure 1A, but the voters told us they wanted a different solution. Staying true to doing the next right thing, we are seeking additional flexibility with ARPA funds and will take advantage of the recent federal infrastructure bill. This challenge isn't over and we will continue to seek long-term solutions to our transportation needs. Now to economic development. Under the leadership of our economic development director, Crystal Latier, the county has distributed over $20 million in CARES Act and ARPA fund grants to over 1,400 local small businesses and nonprofits. We focused on areas of the economy hardest hit by last year's shutdowns. This work preserved 15,000 jobs and more than a billion dollars in economic output. And I was personally told by a local business owner that these efforts not only saved his business, but also saved his family. <laughs> Additionally, Crystal and her team have showcased our county internationally. Last year, El Paso County co-hosted the America's Competitiveness Exchange Tour. Delegates from South America and Europe came to study our local successes across dozens of industries, including defense, sports, arts, cybersecurity, and manufacturing. I was proud how our region hosted our visitors, built international friendships, and showcased the prestige and power of our region. On a new topic, and thinking more strategically, under the leadership of our facilities director, Brian Olson, and his team, we recently sold several of our underutilized properties, putting them back into commercial circulation and helping downtown development. With the proceeds, we upgraded elevators and addressed other deferred maintenance. And we have also completed hundreds of ADA projects to make county facilities more accessible. These investments were an easy choice when, pri when your priority is doing the next right thing. And now to our coroner, Dr. Leon Kelly and his team. They've been recognized time and again for their achievements. And now other states have taken notice. Wyoming's governor recently invited Dr. Kelly to speak about the role coroners can play in suicide prevention, a cause Leon has championed for years. Dr. Kelly and his team are an undeniable asset both to El Paso County and the other 20 counties his office already supports with coroner services throughout the state. Now we have so many more outstanding county offices and employees serving you. I thank our assessor, Steve Schleicher, and his team who are well regarded across the state. After the devastating Boulder County Marshall Fire, Steve and his team did the next right thing and offered to deploy at a moment's notice to support Boulder County. They are also presently sharing assessor lessons learned from El Paso County's past natural disasters. I also thank our treasurer, Mark Louderman, and his team for recently adding public trustee services to their portfolio. And I thank our human services team and their 350 caseworkers who, all, who help thousands of families day after day, often with little recognition. And I thank our county attorney, Diana May, and her team who provide outstanding counsel on federal and state law and protect your taxpayer dollars on litigation matters. And finally, I thank our Small Business Development Center and Pikes Peak Workforce Center who continue to deliver outstanding services to our citizens and companies.
You may know El Paso County has made significant investments in our region using CARES and ARPA funding. Our cities were on the front lines of the COVID response, but not eligible for CARES Act dollars. El Paso County did the next right thing and shared $41 million of our funds with our municipalities to keep them in the fight. Additionally, we provided $8 million to public health and over $18 million to our jail and other county facilities to make them more COVID safe. In all, we will use almost $140 million in ARPA funds to support economic recovery, public health and safety, water and broadband infrastructure, stormwater, and mental health resiliency for our families and youth. You can rest assured these funds will serve our citizens, communities, and support COVID and economic recovery. And speaking of investments, El Paso County is thrilled to announce our investment in a rural broadband initiative which will improve people's lives. For many of our rural residents, high-speed internet isn't an option. That's why we will run fiber internet to, uh, count to county facilities in Calhan and Security Wide Field, and we are working with private internet providers to deliver upgraded access to homes and businesses. We are grateful for the substantial commitments made by our private sector partners to expand access to county residents. Now, why does this matter? because broadband is a way to reduce both COVID risk and road congestion. And also, none of our children should have to do homework on a borrowed Wi-Fi signal in a restaurant parking lot. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our economic and political strength is powerful enough to influence outcomes on a national scale. I am proud that El Paso County is doing the next right thing and taking a stronger leadership role to keep Space Command right where it belongs. Our message is simple and potent. Why waste billions of dollars moving a deck chair around that will deliver no more capability and place national defense at risk? We've joined forces with the City of Colorado Springs, the Chamber and EDC, Representative Doug Lamborn, our, the rest of our state delegation and others, and with this team, we will get the job done. And speaking of collaboration, it's time to declare our Regional Office of Emergency Management a success. Since its creation in 2019, We've had several fires that could have been disasters, and last October's local bird's eye fire was no exception. The blaze began on a warm, windy Friday near a heavily wooded area in northern El Paso County. Conditions were ripe for disaster, but the Pikes Peak Regional OEM and more than 200 first responders from across our region turned a fire into a footnote. Ladies and gentlemen, we owe a debt of gratitude to the men and women who fought the bird's eye fire and kept it under control. If you're, thank you. If you're one of those heroes who was there that day, please stand and be recognized. Thank you for all that you do to keep our communities safe. Now last year, El Paso County Parks celebrated 50 years, and the next 50 years are looking great. We know our county parks are essential for our health, enjoyment, and COVID safety, and our offerings grow as we grow. Our Community Services Department has added the Kane Ranch and Santa Fe open spaces, and they have big plans to improve the Hanson Trailhead, Falcon Regional Park, and our unique Paint Mines Park. Our parks are a treasure. And if you've not done so recently, we invite you to enjoy these beautiful spaces. In 2021, we announced our Smart Work Initiative, the brainchild of Jeff Eckert, our Digital Strategy and Technology Director, and our Facilities Director, Brian Olson. Smart Work was created to manage a remote workforce and better utilize space, ensuring county employees could still provide crucial citizen services 
remotely in a safe environment. The best part? Smart Work saved taxpayers $60 million by eliminating a future need for additional facilities to house our growing workforce. Now looking forward, there are many more potential next right thing goals that we should discuss as a region. One of those is water reuse. Reusing water we already own could reduce stress on our northern aquifers and reduce the cost of acquiring more water rights. Another goal for fun, and I, I would love to see a beer brewing school in our region, and many of you have heard me mention this. And finally, I think we should I think we should pursue our own federal court district. We're the largest region in the U.S. without one, and using the federal courts in Denver, in Denver is both expensive for us and may not deliver a jury of our peers. Ladies and gentlemen, results like this don't happen by accident. Great things happen here because we have dedicated people doing the next right thing. I commend our county elected officials, our workforce, and our partners and leaders from Calhan, Colorado Springs, Fountain, Green Mountain Falls, Manitou Springs, Monument, Palmer Lake, and Rama for their commitment to work together. And I especially thank our businesses and citizens who continue to deliver essential goods and services under these difficult circumstances. You know, there are communities across the country suffering because they don't cooperate. We have chosen a different path, and we must work to continue that path of cooperation. We choose to remember the things that we are grateful for, like our families, our friends, and those we serve. And that's why we will make it through this crisis stronger than ever. And we all want essentially the same things safe neighborhoods, good schools, job opportunities, and a great place to go on a Saturday night. And as we close, here is my challenge to you. We should embrace growth while working together to preserve the, what makes this place special. We must continue regional, political, business, and community collaboration. We need to deepen important conversations about water reuse, affordable housing, infrastructure, culture, art, and the protection of our freedoms. We need to recognize that we are no longer a small county and must think bigger and bolder and use our economic and political power for the greater good. And along the way, let's make sure to have a little fun, make more friends, cross another item off your bucket list, and engage in conversations about the future of our region. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for all the great work that you do. God bless you. God bless our county, our region, and our great country. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to working with all of you going forward. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you again. One more round of applause for our chairman. Thank you. And I also want to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, we could not have these great events like today. Uh, but also I want to thank you all for the collaboration and the regionalism. And I know that we're just going to continue that throughout the year. I will say, when you are the MC, this is what always happens. They hand you a couple of names of really important people that you missed. So two more folks that are here today, if you'll stand to be recognized. Our surveyor, Richard uh, Merritt. Mer oh, I'm going to mess. See, I didn't get to practice his name. Mariotti, thank you. Richard Mariotti, thank you. And Assessor Stephen Schleicher.
I, I told the team, I just bought a house. You can't make me miss the assessor and the surveyor, please. Ah, sorry, gentlemen, I will work on those names. Thank you, each and every one of you, for being here today, and especially for welcoming me to this community and helping us build just this incredible place that we get to call home. Our future here is bright and our region continues to grow. And the next right thing is for each of us to remain engaged and to make sure that we are intentional about that growth. We look forward to hopefully seeing you back here next Wednesday, January 19th, for the 2022 State of the State with our governor, Governor Jared Polis, and Senate President Leroy Garcia. They will both be here, so please get your reservations in. And I also want to take this moment to remind you, we value our partnerships with the state of Colorado and with the Office of Economic Development and International Trade. Just last week, they opened applications for the Advanced Industries Accelerator Program. These are four grants that can advance your business while increasing our state's competitiveness. So, Kelly Leverton, I know you are somewhere in the room. If you will wave over here to my left. Kelly is our new director of a business um, expansion and retention, and I would love for you to talk with Kelly if you think your business might be eligible. So our good friends at Boot Barn have another event today. So we kindly ask that you make a sweet and somewhat uh, swift exit from today. But please, thank you all, friends. We look forward to seeing you next week.